turns out businesses like volunteering now, okay? So this has uh, been around for a long time in the United States, uh, but it is a trend that is overtaking the world, and they don't know how to do it very well. Uh, so um, they don't know, uh, they, they, they know how to brand, they know how to you know, align, they know how to talk about cause, uh, they, know how to, they know how to do a lot of these things, right? <sighs> but in terms of mobilizing people, they struggle like everybody else. And workplace giving, same thing. These are two burning questions for them. So I want us to think today, when we talk about this really, for the, for the remainder of the time, I, I want to answer this question, why bother with corporate volunteering? And the thing we're going to add into this, but you won't see it in every slide, is workplace giving. Because the two go together. What's the ratio that we multiply, that we use to multiply um, giving by when we come to a volunteer? Non-volunteer, volunteer, how much more do they give? But it's 10. And companies know, they know, you know, giving is one thing, but if we don't mobilize our people, if we can't get them volunteering and create some distinct impacts that can draw the strengths of our brand into the community for long-term, sustainable, meaningful change, then we're only, you know, uh, half getting it done. Okay? So why bother with corporate volunteering? First, this is the best reason to do anything. Everybody's doing it, okay? <laughs> Seriously, it was the one you learned early on when you were little. It hasn't changed. Everybody's doing it. Why aren't you? United Way in Australia did, did, did this little study. And they found that 36% of corporate volunteers reported they were volunteering for the first time. Okay, so what that means is, these people, if the business hadn't offered, where they work hadn't offered an opportunity to volunteer, they wouldn't be volunteering. Companies are in the weird place now of being gatekeepers to pro-social behavior and civic engagement. Now, they've always wanted pro-social behavior in the workplace, right? Let's be better teammates, let's share information, let's get along, don't hog the water cooler, that kind of thing. But now, I mean, they are gatekeepers to the community, to bigger problems, to global issues. And that's good because they're also being evaluated on those things as well. So this is a study in Australia. If you did one in, uh, we did one in Canada, uh, University of Toronto did one about three years ago, it, it said 47% of people who volunteer for the first time in Canada will do so, it was in 2010, through work. That's weird. Okay. And once people volunteer, they all want to volunteer again. In fact, 50% said, this didn't totally stink. I'm coming back, right? Okay. So, it's addictive. It's like a drug. This is the business school uh, in uh, Spain, IESE. We did a little project with them uh, last year. Uh, they produced a manual with some other groups in Europe. Here's what, here's what they said in a recent study that was released just a few weeks ago. Employee volunteering is a recent phenomenon with 14% of companies launching corporate volunteering programs in 20... And you can't see it, but that's 11. All right. So 14% of the companies that are doing it, and it's less than a third of the companies in Spain that are doing it, uh, just started. It's new. Now, like I said, the United States, it's been happening for a long period of time. You can go all the way back to the post office when they used to write answer letters to Santa, okay, that's kind of employee volunteering. Nobody was paying to do it. A bunch of employees decided to do that. That was in like 1920 or something like that. So it's been around, but it's part of the social fabric of this country. <coughs> volunteering, civic engagement. In 2010, 89% of companies had a formal domestic employee volunteering program. 52% had an international one. Okay, there's been a, they went, in 2006, companies sent people to four countries around the globe. 52 last year. So it is blowing up. Okay, amazingly, 94% of companies offered at least one gift matching program. All right, now, wow, this is a moneymaker because this is a pain point for companies. So through this presentation, we'll talk about what companies are looking for and how we can move from handouts or just raising money to full-on partners that they uh, need, right? You are the traditional gatekeepers, the voice, the champions, the voice of the community. They absolutely need you to do this well and to do this right, and they want to do it right. Well, one of the, one of the things I want to explore as we talk is some win-win places. 94% of companies in the United States that they surveyed, CECP, and they surveyed this huge sample, it's one of the best reports for this kind of thing around, they offer a, match, a matching gift program, like a dollar for doer program, right? 94%. Guess what the uptick is, the uptake is among employees in companies in participating in these programs? Like how many employees will actually, who volunteer? 
who volunteer will actually uh, 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 submit their hours to qualify uh, for a match for the volunteer hours. That's how it works. I go volunteer for 10 hours. The company matches $17 per hour. $170 goes to the nonprofit. Easy peasy, right? I volunteer. The company dumps the money into that nonprofit. They get to give the money to the community. I volunteer. It's all working together. It's that integration we were talking about. What's the percentage? Anybody? Anybody at all? 30, 50, 9, 7.8%. And every CSR manager I know, it, they hate their job because of it. They put out so many emails. They put up so many billboards, placards. They, they put it on the company, you know, the, the flat screen TVs of their company. They do everything they know. It's on the intranet. They get their vice president, their senior vice president, their CEO to talk about it. 7.8%. Microsoft one of our clients, is really good, that's my disclaimer, is really good at corporate citizenship. And they're pretty transparent about it too. Guess what their number was? 7.8% last year. They were dead on with this study. They managed to notch it up to 10.1%. It's a big achievement. But he's got bags of money, literally, in his office. He said, I can't give these out. <laughs> I, you know, there's a thousand nonprofits in the United States that could qualify for this. I, I've got it. We got to burn this on Friday because <laughs> I can't give it back or they'll cut my budget. So I don't know what to do, right? So that's his problem. Microsoft is not burning money. That's a joke. So that's just it. For all of those literal people out there making notes, thinking, I, I got to look that one up. So this is easy, easy money. But it does take a little work to get to. It's there. Uh, but they need nonprofits that know how to get their employees engaged enough to sit down and put the data in. Now, there is a problem of the, some of the online tools are like built by Fred Flintstone. They're awful. <laughs> it takes a half hour. I finally logged my hour. I'm going to just donate money next time. That was so painful. Okay? So there is that. So, we, uh, uh, this is Angela uh, presenting in uh, Slovakia, where they were dying to hear about employee volunteering and workplace giving. 150 companies from in Bratislava, from Slovakia. I know I had to look it up on the map too. Um, so we get asked to speak about this to companies all over the world. It is a significant trend. It is at, on the top of the list of things that they want to see happen, employee engagement. And that's because it is about employee engagement. Companies are beginning to realize that, 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 that if you can add meaning and purpose and integrate those two things together in the workplace that, that some good, good stuff happens. All right? right? Now, 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 according to a recent global report, fewer than one in three, employ fewer than one in three employees are engaged. Okay? Nearly 17% are disengaged. The middle, middle category is non-engaged. It costs in the UK, they, they, they coughed up $64 billion for non-engaged and disengaged. In the U.S., it was $350. When the survey was done last year, Gallup says it was $410. $410 billion were just... My eyes will send it to Microsoft and let Kevin burn that, too, because we're just wasting it all, okay? Again, that's a joke. Microsoft is not burning any money. So, um, so this... But the, on the other side, Gallup performed this huge study over all these countries with all these people, and they found that for every employee that's engaged, Profitability goes up by 16%. Customer loyalty, 12% up. Quality increased by 60%. So depending on what you're making, that's pretty cool, right? Uh, so that if you apply that, again, to a typical non-engaged employee at Microsoft, you can bump them up to engaged. It's revenue per employee. It's $64,800 per employee that Microsoft can make if they can bump up to that category. Employee volunteering provides people... Not everybody, but if you're ready for it, that moment of epiphany, that space where you think, oh, I see. And you get an opportunity to have a moment of clarity. And if your workplace is offering, and they do a good job of integrating what's going on out there, my life, my personal interests, and my work, all of a sudden those things kind of like teach you. Hmm. And my job matters. And that means something to the community, to business, but also to me personally. Who doesn't want to live out a sense of meaning and purpose? Uh, let's talk about healthier employees. 
United Healthcare Group, along with Volunteer Match, did a little study. Turns out that people who volunteer are healthier, okay? Not as much heart disease, not as much stress. In Hungary, they did a similar study in 1970, something or another, among factory workers. The employees who were engaged uh, lost less of their fingers in the factory. Okay, so that's a pretty, you want a hard number to benchmark against. <laughs> Raise hands. Okay, you're not really a volunteer. Go over there. Okay, how does this trend affect me? What do companies need from nonprofits, charities? Okay. And finally, what does an outstanding employee volunteering program actually involve? Okay. Let's, let's, let's run through this really quickly here. There are four conditions to a successful employee volunteering or workplace giving program or sustainability program. We use this approach with our clients, whether we're talking about one or all three. And usually you end up talking about all three. Okay. Two of these conditions are what employees want. Two of these conditions are what you need to give your employees. Here we go. First condition is space. Then we've got structure, movement, and motivation. These are the four conditions we need to think about. The first one, let's think about motivation. Okay. The condition of a successful employee volunteering program, we've got to think about motivation. Right? Motivation is absolutely essential because people want, employees want, a sense of meaning. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about aligning purpose with work. We're talking about integrating these things. We're talking about helping companies achieve what they want. We're, helping, we're talking about helping them uh, attract the best talent off campus that is looking for this out of the chute. They're no longer wait to go to the Rockefeller approach, hard business living, and then give it all away at the end. They want to start day one. We can help them do that, right? Everybody wants a sense of meaning. It doesn't matter if we're going to do a presentation in India or somewhere else. When you talk about in motivation, we have to think about intrinsic versus extrinsic. This is a simplification, oversimplification of this very complicated topic, but because I got a master's in divinity, not psychology, we're going to stick to this, and plus it actually helps the time pass a little quicker. Intrinsic versus ex extrinsic. Extrinsic motivation is motivation that matters to me, but it's extrinsic to me. Okay, so I am, I am a non-engaged employee, not just not hostily disengaged, just non-engaged. So I kind of, I'm a Friday fun guy, right? Boss comes by and says, hey, Chris, I got a job for you. I'm like, oh, do you really? Yeah. Look, there's no overtime or anything, but it could be really good for your career. We're going to meet over the weekend. We're going we're gonna to pound this out. It's going to be great. You on board? <laughs> you know I am. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Love your enthusiasm. You're an idiot. Okay. <laughs> he walks away. What am I going to say, right? I got to do it. I'm not enthused, however, because I'm not intrinsically motivated. And when he gets in Bob's office down the hall, hey, Bob, I gotta, what, 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 what do you need? What do you need? I'll get you coffee. I'll get you, I'll do anything. What do you need? No, Bob, just calm down. Calm down. I got a project, and I'm thinking you might be good on it, but you gotta be calm. Uh, whatever you need, boss. Whatever you need. I can do it. I can do it. I'll stay all weekend. I'll sleep here. I would eat. Bob, you're not sleeping here again. We talked about that. You're not sleeping here. <laughs> but it could be a good opportunity. You'll be here on the weekend. Oh, you know I will. I've been waiting for this. I won't let you down. I won't let you down. Bob, get up off the ground. Please get up off the ground. <laughs> Talked about this too. Thank you. We'll see you later. Oh my God. A weirdo. Okay, so <laughs> Bob's very intrinsically motivated. He wants to be there. He plays for the love of the game. He's in the flow. He's in the moment. He just loves his job. Me, nah, not so much, right? Intrinsic versus extrinsic. Extrinsic. When people come to work with our nonprofit the first time, get involved in our cause or our community or the issues that we represent, that we are champions for, they probably don't have a clue what we're talking about, right? So when we ask them to show up and volunteer for these kids in the tutoring program every Thursday for two hours for the next six months, it makes a lot of sense to us because these kids don't have any continuity in their life from an adult whatsoever, maybe in the school system. But by golly, they're going to get it from you, the volunteer, or don't bother showing up. And you're like, well, that makes sense to me, but I've never tutored before. I'm lucky I even found this place. I was lost. I never go past whatever that street is. And... I don't, I don't, it's a bit like asking, a, you know, you show up on a blind date with a prenup. I mean, <laughs> I need a chance to really get to know you first, right? Before I'm going to commit, and most people feel that way. But I get why we as nonprofits do it. <sighs> it just makes the divide pretty difficult for most people who are extrinsically motivated. So what we can help companies do is find their influencers. Start with the people who are already sold out. Find them. One third of their company is full of people who love volunteering, who are involved in some sort of cause. Figure out a way to collaborate, that's the word that was used earlier, with them on this new company focus or this company program, 
most people who volunteer aren't like just one cause only. Kind of, they have an affinity with the idea of volunteering and civic engagement. They're influential. Help your company find them. You might actually have some of them at your organization. Companies will want to talk about rewards and recognition as if this is the be all and end all of locking people in for a long haul. But giving people who've been volunteering for 20 years a bumper sticker or a hat or a button that says, you're doing a great job, thanks for coming out, can land a little flat sometimes. Because those people don't need that, right? It's never, ever, ever wrong to say thank you or to say it many times. But we need to meet people at their highest level of contribution. And that means we need to take into account that people have different kinds of motivation for getting involved in the first place. People who have been doing it for 20 years and are sold out to it, intrinsically motivated, they're motivated for different reasons, just like Chris and Bob in those offices for staying afterwards, okay? Now think about growing up yourself, or if you've got teens, what happens? When it comes to the music my parents listen to, it's so lame, oh my gosh. <laughs> I would never wear those clothes. Your movies, oh, how can you even watch this? So dumb. You know, this whole thing, right? And then you become your parent, and you're like, eh, well, it wasn't that bad, <laughs> right? But it's called differentiation. Every human being goes through it, and we need to own the experience for ourselves. And what we can do sometimes is we can displace our employees' experience by telling them why we think it's so great. We need to create free space for them to explore and understand giving them some direction and, and explaining the space. We've already said that's absolutely important because when people show up for the first time to your cause, to your community, to your issue, they don't, they're disoriented. They don't understand what's going on. They need a chance to fall in love. So they do need some direction, but they don't need to be told why you think they should be there. <laughs> Let them find out for themselves. Okay, so you want to meet people at the highest level of contribution. Speaking about motivation, people want a sense of meaning. We have to meet people at the highest level of, of contribution. And there are three stages in the journey of a volunteer. Now, I want you to think this is the journey of an engaged person in, in the kinds of things I'm talking about. Whether it's workplace giving, volunteering, or sustainability programs, there are going to be basically three stages. Now, there might be 1,500, but again, for purposes of a presentation, it's easy to talk about it in three stages. The first stage is that of a tourist. There's nothing wrong with being a tourist. If I show up in Greece for the first time, I am going to look a lot like a tourist. I've never been there before. I don't know what to go, where to go. I'm going to stay at the tourist hotel, go to the tourist beach, get on the tourist bus. I'm going to eat at the tourist restaurant. I don't know. I'm going to have a fun time. I'm going to wear a tourist hat. I'm going to look a little bit like this, right? <laughs> Everybody's going to know I'm a tourist. That's okay. That's where we all start. That's the first stage. I don't know what's expected of me. I don't know what to do. You're going to have to hold my hand. And when people show up to volunteer for the first time, they ha there's this level of curiosity about them. They're just curious. They think there's something here. Their friend has asked them to come. Their religious leader has told them to come. Their kids drag them out. There's an extrinsic reason to be there, and they're curious, but they are not committed. First time, no way. Now, that means that we have to create the right kind of space for a tourist, right? To meet them at their level, which isn't very high. You can't ask much of a tourist. But if I come back, a traveler, if I become a traveler and I go to Greece two, three, four, five times a year, Love Athens. It's great. Beautiful city. Okay, so travelers, I will not stay at the tourist hotel, go to the tourist beach, get on the tourist bus, or eat at the tourist restaurant. I will find the cool place to stay, the cool place to live, and I'll go to that cool beach that nobody else knows about because I'm a kind of a traveler. I know my way around here, you know, and I'm not going to stand out like someone who's shown up for the first time. This is a second stage in the journey of a volunteer. You go from, I don't know what's expected of me, I don't know what at-risk means, I don't know what, why kids are on the street, why they just go home, I don't understand why people just don't get a job, I don't understand you know, why you don't take advantage of the great American dream, I don't understand any of that. They get exposed to it a little bit, and they come over and they're like, oh, okay, I see. I can only take advantage of the great American dream if I have access to an education, if I have a good network, if I understand the rules of the middle class, uh, social rules, if I, you know, then I begin to get a little bit more informed. I know what's going on. I understand the issues, right? Travelers have spiritual vertigo like I did. They tend to be very emotional as opposed to a tourist which is kind of like, well, it's fun. I'm here for the first time. I don't know what to expect. Okay, so let's say, what's your name? George. George. George, the board member, the newly christened board member, and I go out on a date, okay? So George and I are dating. He's kind of a cute looking guy. So, uh, I don't think that's what you're supposed to say. Good looking guy, cute, I don't know, whatever. So anyways, we go out on a date, right, George? We're sitting in the theater, and George is biting his nails. You know, just sitting there. I'm like, oh my gosh, George is so cute. He's biting his nails. We're about to watch Avengers, and this is just, just <laughs> delightful, okay? So George and I, um, 
we fall in love and uh, we stay together and two years later we're sitting in the theater and he's biting his nails and I'm like, are you kidding me with the <laughs> nail biting? I mean, so what happened? I became connected, emotionally involved. He becomes sort of a part of me in my life and all of a sudden all those little cute quirks when I don't know him and I'm just sort of mildly curious about who he is and everything's woo, delightful. Now they kind of, some things break me the wrong way. And same thing with volunteers. They're standing around the kitchen, you know, at the Christmas party talking to their family, they've been volunteering at the community kitchen for the last year and they kind of understand the issues. And last year they might have been like, why can't these bums go get a job? And now they're like, well, do you understand the real issues? And then the rest of the family is thinking, are you serious with all of this talk all the time? Can you talk about anything else? You used to talk about golf and now it's just poor people and homelessness and habitat and how we should all go out and build a habitat home. Oh my gosh, can you give it a break? It's Thanksgiving for Pete's sake. Let's talk about golf, the way God intended. Or football, rather. Canadian, sorry, got that one wrong. It's not golf at Thanksgiving. <laughs> So travelers are a different stage, and we can kind of depend on them for something different. Guides are people who move to Greece for six months out of the year. Guides are sold out. If a traveler is curious, uh, if a tourist is curious, and a traveler is looking for meaningful, something meaningful, so something, there's, there's an intentionality around it, intentionally, intentional discovery, right? A guide has found this alignment. They know why they're there. You don't need to convince them. They will be there longer than the staff for that cause, for that community, for that event. And you know, you know some guides. At the end of the day, if they had to take a bullet for what they believed in, you'd be there and they'd be right there beside you. But not because they owed it to you or anybody else, but because they believe in it from the bottom of their feet, the top of their head, they are just sold out to it. And they think everybody else should get a chance to be too. They're includers. They're, they're guides. They bring people in. Guides need to be at the forefront of leading this missional organization. Tourists, travelers, guides. Tourists are there to explore. They don't care what you do because they just don't care yet. Travelers, they do care and they're a pain. But they've got a lot of potential. If you've got someone who's, who has an opinion about everything and is telling you what they think you should do, they might have a personality disorder, but more likely they're a traveler. And they're on the way to becoming a guide if you can just cultivate it. Give them more responsibility. Say, you got a problem with that? You run it. Oh, okay, okay. I mean, don't abandon them, right? Work with them. But travelers need an opportunity for more, more discovery and more leadership. And guides, we should be sitting with them around the boardroom table, but they will be bored at the board level. They want to get their hands dirty. And they should be leading the whole thing. We should be facilitating their leadership. This way we can manage a process and not a bunch of people. Let the guides and the travelers pull the tourists in, explain it to them. Let them be the people who become the ones who become the champion voices for your community, for your cause, and for your effort. Mm -hmm. Two thoughts. I want to give you an example of the right kind of space. When I talk about space for tourists, I, I promise you, if you're a nonprofit and you run a program, I'm telling you to do more work than it seems like it will ever, ever be worth. I'm telling you to become inefficient. I'm telling you to create lots of space for people to have an experience and not to volunteer. Tourists are lousy volunteers. They can move boxes from here to there. They can lick envelopes, but we'll lose them if we do that. We need to give them an experience, a chance to fall in love. When we leave with cognitive information, when we tell people why it's great and what the stats are, people tend to shut down. When we leave with cognitive categories, people shut down. Okay? Uh, you need to give people an emotional context for what they see and what they hear. Lead with emotion. Give people an experience like this. It's a pain. Nonprofits are not in the business of being inefficient and giving people an experience. We don't want to be zoos where we, you know, parade people around and look, say, look at the broken, the homeless, and the, the addicted. See, isn't this terrible? We don't want to do that. But there is a way to provide experiences for people where they can get up close and personal. There's, a, there's actually a study out of uh, School of Business yeah, Wharton School of Business. Apparently, if you get people up close and personal to those they are serving in the employment sense, they become, what is it? One five-minute interaction with people who benefit from their products and services can produce a 500% increase in employee productivity. The guy's got a whole algorithm. They did this long study over multiple years. It works in our world, too. You get people up close and personal to the cause, the issue, the community, the environment, whatever your cause is, even if it's animals, let them get something under their fingernails and go home. They will buy into it. 
they buy into it, they become 10 times more likely to give, and they will be with you for the long haul. They will turn into travelers and guides who will pull other people into it. Many of you represent the trench work, the hard front line stuff, the grueling piece of all of this. The companies want to partner with you in very significant and meaningful ways, very supportive ways, very e egalitarian ways. Now, getting there is going to take some time, but you hold a promise of something that can unlock a new reality for us here in this country and around the world. I think it is really, really essential, important, the work that you do. You hold the stories. You hold the opportunities to have the experience that I had in Toronto, where you wake up and you just realize there's more here. This is not who I want to be. I don't want to live unaware. I want to be in there. I want to matter. 